This video was brought to you by Mubi. The light in the eyes of others, they guide you on your way. It was Immanuel Levinas who was among the first philosophers to really explore the implications of the face of the other. And by this he did not mean literal faces, but rather he was trying to articulate what in German is known as the gestalt of a person, or gelaat in Dutch. It's essentially the true appearance of other human beings. It's that which lets us empathize with them and recognize them as autonomous individuals with their own thoughts, emotions, and inner richness. But it's not just I'm, I'm seeing you in front of me, it's I see into you. I see you. I see you. It might feel like a cliché to point this out, because we are all obviously aware that other people exist and have their own identities and interiorities which are just as complex as ours. And yet, even though we are aware of that conceptually, sometimes it can still be strangely overwhelming on a more experiential level. For we do not just rationally acknowledge the existence of others, we feel it. It has psychological as well as physical implications for us, leading into what is pretty much Levinas's fundamental question. What is humanity and what does it really mean for us? Right, How you doing tonight? This is, of course, also a fundamental aspect of cinema, because regardless of what kind of story a movie has to tell, most of them start with us buying into the realness of the characters, which is something that I've always been fascinated by. Because when people talk about great acting, they tend to focus on the big moments, you know, the dramatic outbursts, like... But personally, I was always more interested, as Thomas Flight recently made a great video about, in subtle performances, in the smaller moments that really convince me I'm watching not just an actor putting on a great performance, but a real human being. Would you like to come visit me this Sunday? Yes. This can be achieved in countless different ways, from meticulously rehearsed moments to more spontaneous, perhaps even incidental ones. But one aspect that they often seem to share, however, for me at least, is the presence of a conflict between body and mind, between involuntary physical driving forces, such as fear, stress, excitement, and by the conscious mind that tries to suppress them. Take for example how F. Murray Abrams Salieri is trying to not reveal just how impressed he is by Mozart's work in Amadeus, or Emma Thompson in this scene from Love Actually, where she plays a woman who just found out her husband is cheating on her, but tries to maintain her composure for the sake of the family. My brilliant wife. Ah, uh, yes. I think the reason I love little moments like these so much is because they just feel so revealing. Because they make it seem so obvious that behind the facade of the literal face, beyond the superficial expression or emotion that is being communicated, there is so much more going on. A deeper interiority that we can intuitively sense, and which signifies that humanity that Levinas was so concerned with. The obvious reason for why I love this kind of acting, and more generally, for why we want characters in movies to feel real is because, well, we want to experience real human beings. Whether we can relate to them directly or not, they make us feel less alone. They ensure us that whatever we are going through is experienced by others as well. It makes us more open to connect with them, to share with them, and to find support in that effort. But for Levinas, experiencing the face of the other had deeper implications. It wasn't just a comforting experience to ease our existential dread. It was also a moral imperative. You know, George, I feel that in a small way we are doing something important. It's satisfying a fundamental urge. The best way to explain this ethical responsibility that Levinas found in the humanity of others is by looking at the inverse, at what really happens when we, intentionally or accidentally, cause harm to another human being, and at what this really reveals about us and the nature of humanity. In Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, a grandiose young man named Raskolnikov commits a murder as he believes he is acting towards some higher purpose and is therefore exempt from the moral laws of the common people. When I first read the book, I expected the story to be a rather emotionally detached intellectual exercise. 
I thought that, like its main character, it was going to be about philosophical reasoning and coming to rational conclusions about morality and about humanity. But to my surprise, after the murder took place, Raskolnikov spends most of the novel in his bed, stricken with fever, delusions and all kinds of other ailments. In other words, what Dostoevsky was actually showing us here, I think, was that humanity and the moral responsibility it invokes is not just a construct of the mind, but a palpable force that affects every fiber of our being. Bring that up. Whenever I see a movie that revolves around people dealing with remorse, this idea of guilt haunting not just their mind but really inhabiting their body has really stuck with me. Some notable examples, without going into spoilers, are Colin Farrell's character Ray in In Bruges, Kim Wexler in Better Call Saul, Fleabag in Fleabag, and Lydia Tarr in the excellent recently released movie Tarr. <gasps> what these characters have in common is not just that they all harmed another human being, but also that despite their best efforts to escape from, rationalize, or suppress any feelings of guilt, there is something inside them that, physically speaking, just won't let them. Ray can barely restrain himself from panicking even at the slightest reminder of his wrongdoing. Fleabag 2 experiences significant trigger-induced episodes of stress. Lydia can't sleep and suffers from delusions. And Kim tried to push everything away for so long that at one point, her body quite literally burst. <laughs> We generally see our conscience as a psychological trait, something that we construct mentally, like our voice of reason but for moral issues. But what these cases of guilt demonstrate is that there's an undeniable physiological aspect to it as well. Now, it is well known that psychological issues can manifest themselves physically in our body, but I wonder if there's not more to it than that. Levinas actually argued that there was a theological aspect to this, Meaning that he believed, to simplify it somewhat, that in the face of the other, we also see the face of God. Or at least a reflection of the divine. Which in turn would also explain why hurting someone becomes such a cardinal sin. It's not just a crime against humanity, it's a crime against God. Do you believe in all that stuff, Ken? The last judgment and the afterlife. Sins and hell and... Oh. But even from a more evolutionary perspective, wherein consciousness is not spiritually separated from the rest of our body, but rather a function of it, it is interesting to examine what this kind of guilt really tells us. Because if our mental states, and therefore our conscience, are more directly intertwined with our physiological constitution, with our natural instincts and behaviors, one could argue that our conscience is not just a result of nurture, but also, in part at least, of our nature. Meaning that we do not just experience guilt as the result of deliberate reasoning, but also as an intuitive reflex. In other words, what the experience of guilt could imply is that we are biologically incentivized to not hurt each other. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. Now, even though I'm no expert on this subject and can't make this claim with objective certainty, I still kinda like that idea, if only for its pragmatic value. Because regardless of whether the moral imperative that Levinas saw in the face of the other stems from divine cultivation or evolutionary programming, it is undeniably true that the humanity of others, and specifically, the recognition and experiencing of the humanity of others, plays a vital role in the way we interact with each other. Again, we see this most clearly in the inverse, in what really happens when we cause harm to each other. Because even if guilt incentivizes us to not hurt each other, if history has proven us anything, it is, unfortunately, that we have found ways to circumvent it, and inflict harm in spite of what our conscience would normally dictate. I don't want this to become a treatise on the darkest chapters in human history, but it does seem that time and time again, our most cruel selves come out not when violence is rationalized or potential guilt is reasoned away, but precisely when the face of the other is denied. Atrocities begin by dehumanizing victims, by breaking down that exact barrier that would prevent us to inflict that kind of harm. For as Levinas argued, 
if we would truly experience a human being in their fullness, if we'd feel their emotions, their history, their imperfections and aspirations, their inner depths and complexities as strongly as we feel our own, if we stood in front of the true face of another, then murder would not be possible, not without destroying ourselves too. I am sorry. So sorry. Though these are obviously extreme examples, the tension between the face of the other and the responsibility it invokes also matters in the more benign day-to-day -day interactions, in the little prejudices, the small grievances and all the other minor forms of interference that cloud our perception and diminish the humanity of others in subtle, banal ways. It's only logical, really. After all, we don't just engage with each other in deep, meaningful interactions, but also transactually and conceptually. We don't always see humans, we see bus drivers, bankers, waiters, customers. We see ideas of people, we see stereotypes and categories. Religion, race, sexual orientation, politics, the severity of which tends to increase the further they are removed from our own identity. We dehumanize others in these quiet little ways every day, but we can dehumanize ourselves too. For as we get lost in abstractions, as we lose sight of the full humanity of others, we can easily lose sight of our own too. We deny what's really inside us to conform with ideas of who we think we should be, and become the very categories that we use to shrink down others. Why do you care about these people? They don't even know you, because you haven't shown but just as we experience guilt when we harm others, for this too our body reacts by slowly disconnecting us from the outside. Even though we might still exist in the same world physically, touching things doesn't feel the same, colors don't seem as bright, music feels distant. Though the sensation is often experienced as one of numbness, our body is essentially screaming at us, imploring us to come back, to get back in touch, Every day you'll wake up and there'll be less of you. You live your life for them and they don't even see you. You don't even see yourself. This is no easy task and, as I already explored in a different essay, a genuine existential crisis is not something to make light of. But going back to Levinas, to him part of the issue of this everyday dehumanization was that we, almost automatically, tend to put ourselves at the center of the universe, not just as a pragmatic consequence of literally experiencing the world from an individualistic perspective, but also as the result of philosophical traditions which have always assumed that reality is to be understood from the perspective of the self, or more simply put, from the inside out. Because as such, as Levinas argues, other people are transformed into objects to be known or to be encapsulated within our own extended sense of self. Take for example how in a relationship, people can't seem to help themselves from trying to make their partners a little bit more like themselves. Either way, the issue is that other people come to be understood predominantly in their relation to us, rather than as beings that we truly experience and appreciate in their own right. So much love inside us that never gets out. We don't get a lot of things to really care about. And this brings us back to the face, which for Levinas was the way to release ourselves from this imprisonment, and from the limits imposed on us by a self-centered worldview. Because in this sense, what the face, the true face of the other does, is communicate to us an understanding of the world from the outside in, communicates to us intuitively, empathically, that we are not the center of existence. That we are, in fact, as the cliché goes, surrounded by beings who are just as emotionally rich, just as intricately complex, just as human as we are. I am not an animal! I am a human being! Don't you think I ever wanted other things? Don't you think I had dreams and hopes? I have suffered much, but I know you have suffered too. I say it's a cliché, but at the same time it's also so easy to forget this, both in the minutia of everyday life as well as in the bigger trials where it seems that, despite all of humanity being at stake, we still refuse to see it, we're still afraid to truly let in the face of the other. 
This is probably because it can be a confrontational experience too. For facing true humanity can also remind us of how distracted, how ignorant, how blind we've really been. Remind us of how much we've just let it gone to waste. Why did I keep the car? Ten people right there. Stop! Cease fire! I killed a little boy. Could have gone. One poor person. And I didn't. <laughs> I wanted to be loved because I was great. I'm nothing. You're all I have. You're all I want to have. I dishonored it all and didn't notice the glory. The light in the eyes of others. They guide you on your way. And yet, despite all this, I think that deep down there is a part of us that wants exactly this. That just longs to break free. This feels especially true when considering how some of the most powerful stories in human history are precisely those in which humanity was placed front and center. Okay, we can make it. When for one extraordinary moment, we set aside everything else, everything that we would normally get so worked up about, our convenience, our comfort, our time, to instead dedicate all of our effort, all of our focus and purpose towards affirming and safeguarding the humanity of others. Not because they mean anything to us personally, not because they are vital to some greater good that indirectly serves us too, but simply because they are truly recognized as human beings. And because in such moments, we know that that is enough. You'll do it, because it must be done. It's stories like these, stories in which the dulling effect of our day-to-day -day life is momentarily broken, when we are briefly stripped from our abstractions, that reveal just how intuitively we are geared towards each other's humanity, and how easily, almost reflexively, it suddenly drives us to act in solidarity and cooperation, suddenly fills us with purpose, with the quietly ecstatic feeling that we are finally engaged in something truly meaningful, that we are finally doing something that truly matters. But obviously these are exceptional occurrences, and it would of course be unreasonable to ask that we act like this all the time. But you know what? Maybe we should. Maybe the true weight of humanity should overwhelm us. Maybe it should hurt us to the point where it forces us to change our ways. Maybe the humanity of others should occupy our every thought and action. Maybe it should be the guiding principle for our every aspiration, both as individuals and as a society. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. And I don't mean this as some elusive utopian ideal, but as an intuitive principle that we already know and act upon when we need it most. A principle that, whenever we feel lost, whenever we fall short, can always be found again in the face of the other. In the humanity that provides us with hope, courage and creativity, with guidance for meaningful engagement and with a clear path towards the betterment of ourselves, of others and of the human race in its entirety. Come on, we're not stopping now. It is a kingdom of conscience or nothing. This video was brought to you by Mubi, the curated streaming service where you can now watch one of my favorite films of the year, Park Chan Wook's Decision to Leave. On the surface it's a neo-noir detective story and murder mystery, but when you dig a little deeper it's really a fascinatingly complex portrait of two people caught up in unspoken desires that even they themselves do not fully understand. One that beautifully communicates that deep sense of humanity discussed in the video. On Mubi you will also find a vast library of other great films from iconic directors to emerging auteurs, with each and every one of them being carefully hand-selected to provide you with the best that cinema has to offer. And if you go to mubi.com slash likestoriesofold, you can try Mubi for free for 30 days. So be sure to claim your extended free trial to check out Decision to Leave and all the other great films presented to you by Mubi.